thank you very much for coming to this panel. We have three um, uh, people presenting really interesting papers. So um, my, I prefer to present each uh, panelist um, just before they present, because otherwise if you present them all in the same time, then you forget who is doing what. So our first um, uh, panelist is uh, Rebecca Price. Um, that um, uh, She's been an archi uh, architecture, urban planning, and the visual resources librarian at the University of Michigan since 1998. Um, and she has um, a PhD, no, uh, sorry, a degree in architectural history from the University of Michigan, and um, a PhD in art history and a master's degree in information science. Um, and um, and she's been involved with at least um, North America for a very long time, serving in various committees and um, chapters. So her paper is um, uh, titled "Materials Collections: Teaching Tactile Literature." So if um, Rebecca. Well, first I want to thank the organizers. This has just been a wonderful conference so far, and I expect the same today. It's been a lot of fun to be here. Um, so let's get going here. Make sure I know the buttons. They're the same here in England as they are at home. Um, <laughs> everything's different, but it's so hot. Um, anyway, I'd like to introduce my presentation and frame my discussion of tactile literacy, which I'll get to in a few moments, um, within the context of the challenges I face in developing and managing a materials collection. So I'll start with two confessions. Um, our materials collection is not heavily used, uh, and that's something I struggle with and something I uh, experience some discomfort with. Uh, and it's a reason I've been exploring this idea of tactile literacy, the sort of the, the why of the collection. What am I doing and why aren't people coming and how can I make it more attractive and appealing to people? Um, so I, I uh, let's see, I, so I, I'm interested in this idea because I really do believe in the, the value of a materials collection um, for teaching, for design practice, and I notice, I, as I've been here in London, I've been able to visit a couple of collections. I went out to Ravensbourne earlier this week, and last night getting to see St. Martin's collection was really interesting. And I know there's a lot more going on, which I'm hoping to experience in the next few days. Um, so that's really interesting. Uh, but I see it's important to study materials collections, sort of step back and look at them maybe, uh, because of the paradoxes that I see at play in, in the environment today. The first paradox, uh, our students and professors, they design in an increasingly virtual world, yet they still design for the physical world. Their creations have to take physical shape and have physical properties. So even though their uh, digital design has become the basis of their conceptualization of space and form, the output of their design has weight, mass, texture, and structure, and is essentially defined by its physical properties. The second paradox, and here I'm speaking more specifically as an architecture librarian, is that architects often don't work on the physical construction of their designs. Generally, they're not the ones to place the beam, to lay the brick, to hang the door, or install a veneer. Yet their designs are manifest in material form, and more explicitly, in material. Of course, this conundrum is not entirely new, yet I think the disconnect of design and product is stark and requires a response that reduces that disconnect, and in fact supports the education of the designer in the physicality of materials. So educating students in the physicality of materials demands attention to the tactile, the tangible, and the real. Now I'm going to be talking about touch as a sensory tool. So if you'll indulge me, I want to take you through a, sh a short or exercise. You don't have to stand up, don't worry, uh, <laughs> to heighten our awareness of touch. We're going to take an imaginary walk in our bare feet. And I have to say, I wrote this a few weeks ago before this, this heat wave. Um, so I want you to uh, close your eyes, take off your shoes, and imagine. It's a hot summer day, yes. <laughs> um, you've just uh, stepped outside your flat or house to your back patio. At first, your feet feel the cool, small, uh, smooth, almost buttery surface of the stone patio. You step from the shadows to the sun-drenched stones, and after a few steps, you feel the heat of the stones, and you have to hop quickly to the cool, grassy edge. Again, I know there's no grass this year, but <laughs> the grass is nice, or you're imagining. Um, the grass is nice. Its soft textures calm your burning feet. But also you notice it's a little wet from the rain we had earlier. If your garden is anything like mine, you've just stepped in a dirt patch and feel the coarse grains of dirt and sand and tiny rocks between your toes, not to mention the prickly weeds. You try to find a softer spot and quickly dart back to the smooth stones of your patio and into the shadows of your home. 
so you can open your eyes, put your shoes back on. Um, anyway, I hope that small exercise kind of reminded you of how much we learn about our environment through touch, from the uncomfortable to the pleasant. Touch is a valuable means of learning about our surroundings and creating knowledge. Yet despite what materials tell us about the spaces and environments that surround us and about the very real physical and psychological impact they have on us, the sensory qualities of materials are often overlooked. I believe that materials collections can foster competencies in the physical nature of materials, or in other words, they help students develop tactile literacy. Now I'm using the phrase tactile literacy as a parallel concept to visual literacy and information literacy, both of which I'm sure you've heard of. Just as visual literacy is about the visual reception and creation of knowledge through image, tactile literacy is the physical reception and creation of knowledge through material. A visually literate person can understand, analyze, and contextualize visual materials by sight. A tactile literate person can understand, analyze, and contextualize physical materials by touch. While visual literacy is about the meaning of the image, tactile literacy is about the materiality of the material. So before going any further, I want to give you a little context about the library where I work. Um, I'm in a library that serves a huge college of engineering with 19 different engineering disciplines. And again, I'm in Michigan, so think cars, think big, <laughs> big things. Um, and then we also serve the College of Architecture and Urban Planning and a School of Art and Design. Uh, we're situated, if you're familiar with Ann Arbor, or just think sort of quintessential Midwest university town. Uh, we're about two miles north of that, that quintessential Midwest university town. Um, we're two miles north of the main campus where on the main campus they teach the arts and humanities, social sciences, pure sciences, and up on our campus it's, as I said, engineering, architecture, uh, art and design, as well as the music school is up there. So sort of the creative arts, the people making things up on north, we call it north campus. Um, and I should say the our campus has about 13,000 students, about 2,000 faculty, and I'd say 90% of that is engineering, and 10% is everybody else. <laughs> so we always have our elbows out to, to make sure that we're um, getting what we need. Um, anyway, the materials collection was initiated to meet needs of the College of Engineering, um, which is nice because they have a lot more money than I have, and we probably wouldn't have gotten off the ground if the engineers hadn't paid for it initially. Uh, but as it did get off the ground, it became clear that it was more interesting to the architecture and art and design students than to the engineering students who were busy making their own materials. So later in the, the Q&A time, I'll be happy to talk more about how I reach out to those various groups and what we're trying to do to involve everybody. Anyway, so having laid the, the foundation with these introductory thoughts and a little context, I want to tell you where we're going in the next 20 minutes. So I'll begin with a brief discussion of developments and changes in architectural education in the last couple of decades, particularly in regard to the increased attention to material studies. Then we'll turn our attention to the investigation of the hand, the creation of knowledge via touch. This will take us on a deeper dive into the concept of tactile literacy. Then I'll share some examples of material investigations by students. And finally, we'll wrap up by looking a little bit into the future. I'll illustrate my presentation with examples of architecture and art and design students using our materials collection, as well as examples of the development and use of materials by faculty in their research and work. And I'll intersperse those with examples, as I've been doing, of details of some materials in our collection in the hopes of sort of eliciting these visual textures for you. Well, traditionally, architectural education has been firmly rooted in the studio, that is, in the practice of drawing. Recently, this is the Michigan studio now, uh, perhaps over the last 10 to 15 years, the studio has been transformed to include technical and material-related explorations. Educators are questioning the fundamentals of design education and studies, and, and studies, sorry, <laughs> and studios, I can't read. <laughs> studios. Studios are places now of multidisciplinary experimentation. They are laboratories and incubators for everything ranging from design build and fabrication practices to community service to material research. This change is addressed in an article entitled Thick Air by Jeff Thune, Kathy Belikov, and Colin Ripley, the first two of whom are University of Michigan faculty, about research they are doing on air as a material in creating interior climates and environments. They cast their investigations in what they call a new species of architectural education, which draws on other disciplines, particularly engineering and, and uh, science-based disciplines, emerging technologies, and investigations of materials and environmental issues. 
Experimental, hands-on learning founded in the practice of learning by making marks this new realm. Responding to these changes in architectural education, there's been a significant increase in the discussion about materials and architecture. It's not simply whether to use stone or concrete, wood or steel, glass or ceramic, or some hybrid in a structure, but examining the long-term implications of material choices, the interaction of one material with another from a system standpoint. And this is a, just a view of our collection of students in the collection. A few years ago, the University of Michigan initiated a materials systems graduate program, and I think that's mirrored elsewhere these days. It's a new, a new way of studying materials. So learning by making, this new paradigm of architectural education necessitates a multifaceted and far-reaching understanding of materials. So let's turn now to the topic of tactile literacy. What is touch? What does it teach us? We're not always aware, I think, of the, the minuscule and myriad ways that touch affects our daily lives. You could take something as mundane as a doorknob, for instance. Adrian Stokes in Rough and Smooth notes that our physical interaction with the building is perhaps most often expressed in the doorknob or the door handle. It's our handshake with the building. And I'd say there's absolutely nothing more tactile than finger painting. Um, well, since Plato, if not before, there, have been philosophical, there has been philosophical discourse on the sense of touch, noting how it differs from the sense of sight but also acknowledging how it pairs with the sense of sight. So we could think of our, our notion of eye-hand coordination working together. The Finnish architect, Johanny Palasma, has uh, taken, this theme in a couple, taken up this theme in a couple books, The Eyes of the Skin in 2005 and The Thinking Hand in 2009. He argues that vision have, has often been the privileged sense and that we trust our eyes over our other senses often. We see this, for instance, in the architecture of the 20th century where the visual minimalism of modernism contrasts with and, and to some degree is favored over the textural and tactile qualities of the architecture of, say, Frank Lloyd Wright or Alvar Aalto. Palasma writes of the primacy of touch. Quote, all the senses, including vision, are extensions of the tactile sense. The senses are specializations of skin tissue and all sensory experiences are modes of touching and thus related to tactility. This fundamental hapticity, hapticity sorry, of the human life world heightens the significance of the hand, end quote. Palasma's thoughts in this regard are building on the arguments of philosophers who have suggested that the sense of touch initiates a perception of an object or texture and brings about a sensory effect within one, one's own body. And I mention that not to complicate my point, uh, but to say that for centuries, touch has been investigated as a means of learning in a visceral way about one's surroundings. The 20th century philosopher Michael Polanyi explores the question of how we gain and process knowledge about our world. He argues that we understand things through position, size, shape, and motion in relation to our physical selves. He's describing the idea of proprioception, that is, understanding and knowing the world by perceiving position and movement. Proprioception, fundamental to kinesiology studies, is rooted in the idea that the perception of self results from the interface between your physical self and the world around you. Um, I'll just describe the slide for just a second. This is our, our collection being used by a, a group of high school students. They've started a summer camp program. And recently, the last few years, the, the instructors have brought the students over. And what they do, I think it's kind of interesting, is the students do rubbings of, of the materials. They don't really care what the material is. They're just doing rubbings to get this idea of texture. And then they take it off and, and use it in another uh, project. But it's kind of a neat, different aspect of, of how the materials collection might be used. Um, in his book, The Craftsman, Richard Sennett goes into some detail about the importance of the hand as a sensory receptor and creator and knowledge creator. There's an embedding of knowledge in the act of touch. Sennett builds on the ideas of Polanyi and Raymond Tallis, another contemporary philosopher and neuroscientist. Tallis suggests that there's an anticipation of knowledge, which involves contact and sensory input, uh, followed by language cognition and reflection. So knowledge gained by touch involves contact, sensory input, verbalization, and reflection. And these all work together to create meaning. Well, these thoughts all speak to the importance and essentiality of touch as a means of gaining knowledge. Just as visual literacy speaks to the crucial need for a student or anyone to know what they're looking at, tactile literacy speaks to the essential need to understand the nature of materials and our relationship to the physicality of the world. 
Palasama writes about this using the term embodied thinking. He argues there's a physicality in the act of creation that comes through the hand and that our bodies become, and our bodies, becoming part of our memory system. And I, I think of my, my daughter took Suzuki piano and her teacher would always talk about uh, muscle memory. And I think that's something that comes through touch. He posits that the essential of, of the essence of something is better understood through the hand and body than through the mind. Embodied thinking, that visceral understanding of something, is informed by materials and our experiences with the physical world. And here you see just a, a more traditional use of materials in, in a pinup from a, a student's project, just taking the materials and putting them beside the, the design ideas. So we've talked about the importance of materials in architectural education, the importance of touch in transmitting knowledge about the physical world. Well, how do touch and material investigation play out in architectural education? How do students become tactile literate? So I'll present an example of how these skills are being taught in the studio, described by Kelly Carlson Reddick, who teaches at University of North Carolina in Charlotte. She posits that the study of materials provides a necessary bridge between theory and practice, and is critical to teaching the Vitruvian principles of architecture. So Vitruvius of ancient Roman times identified the essentials of architecture as firmness, commodity, and delight. While firmness, that's structural integrity, commodity, which signifies utility and functionality, and delight, reflecting the aesthetic qualities of proportion and beauty, are often touted as representing formal elements of architecture. Carlson and Reddick argues that they are bound to the materiality of architecture. They all speak to the significance, immediacy, intention, and agency of material. So in her article, Students Consider Architecture's Materiality, Carlson Reddick describes the difficult process of moving from idea to realization, from concept to object. Um, and she wrote this 20 years ago, so it's very early in the discussion of material education. Um, and the article doesn't really address that whole material systems aspect I was talking about earlier. But it's still illustrative of the attempts to teach tactile competencies. Her pedagogical aim is to move from a purely formal approach to one that requires students consider materials in the production of their work and come to an understanding of the intrinsic nature of the material. The students have three assignments in which they create a small-scale model of a structure, a full-scale detail or ornament, and a standing wall. And in each case, it's not simply a design or form of, in, of indeterminate material, but the material has to be identified and its qualities applied to the design solution. So by creating these objects at different scale and different intent, the students have to think very carefully about their material choices. They have to become knowledgeable about its physical characteristics as well as the layers of meaning. So is, is a material simply a cladding of structure? Is it integral to structure? Okay. Uh, does the material conflict with the structure and form? How does a particular material reflect the purpose of a building? What are the cultural meanings that come with certain materials? or their treatment. Answering these questions requires more than an abstract notion of the materials they use. So I'd like now to highlight a project in which touch is not only imperative to the creative process, but is integral to the goal of the project. This is the work of another University of Michigan architecture professor, Sean Alquist. Alquist has recently been working with a couple different tactile environments, one called color play, which you see here, and one called stretch play. Color play is a stretchable screen which allows one to color, and stretch play is a knitted tensile structure for spatial and tactile engagement. Alquist is specifically addressing the needs of autistic children with sensory processing disorder, or SPD, a disorder in which their sensory perceptions are diminished, usually by the inability to filter sensory data. So through these tactile responsive environments, there's a filtering of sensory input so that the multi-sensory experience is regulated and sorted. The visual, auditory, and tactile interaction of the child with the environment reinforces the notion that communication through eye contact and touch is important, and thereby builds social communication skills. So the project involved architecture students who took on the design and manufacture of the textile structures using a large-scale knitting machine you see on the right there. Um, and com uh, as well as computer science students who develop technologies for sensing touch and pressure. Uh, this, the machine, if you're interested in the sort of the, the nuts and bolts, it's a stoll, it's German, a stoll 14 gauge V-bed weft knitting machine. Um, and here you see Sean with a couple of students and, and one of the fabrics they created on the machine. The students worked on several prototypes. They observed a child interacting with the space and they selected one prototype for further development. 
They refined the final prototype and then were able to deploy it in a therapy center. So this example looks to a future in which materials are completely integrated in design solutions from the beginning of the process. Oh, missed that one. Another of the, the stretch play. This idea points to what is being called a new materiality. Now, Neri Oxman, a professor at the MIT Media Lab, suggests that this is part of an emerging field in design, which she calls material ecology. Oxman argues that since the Renaissance, form and material have often been separated in the design process. Form took precedence, and material was seen as supplemental, secondary to form. This was only amplified by the Industrial Revolution, in which the object could be made repetitively and often without regard to the material it was made of. With computational design tools developed in the past two to three decades, there's been a renaissance in form studies. So in the last decade, this has been augmented and infused with a growing emphasis on ecology and the need to include the environmental impact of material. It's a new joining, or perhaps a rejoining, of materials with the design process, one allowable by digital fabrication techniques and technologies. Oxman writes, designers are now able to compute material properties and behavior integrated into the form generation process. A project she describes in one, is one in which she and collaborators are creating prototypes of membranes, membranes or armors to augment human body functions, increasing strength, flexibility, and ease of motion. These prototypes, while virtual in generation, are anatomical and physiological in design. So there's a, a true integration of biology and technology, of material and form. Oxman's work is bringing forward Carlson Reddick's uh, goal of working toward an integration of materials more fully into the design process. Uh, so this, this new materiality is not just in the pie in the sky future. We see it in innovative products such as this Logitech keyboard in which sensory input becomes an advantage to the product. A fabric mesh is infused into the top layer of the keyboard allowing for a much more responsive tactile experience than a traditional slick keyboard. I was talking with a media technician in one of our labs about this paper, and he noted that several companies are now working on gloves that allow one to feel virtually. So just as virtual reality goggles create a virtual 3D visual environment, these gloves create various tactile sensations, smooth, soft, warm, cool, hard, prickly. Um, so as I wrap this up, I want to emphasize that even though I'm ending up in this digital virtual world of material design, a truly tactile, physically based understanding of materials is crucial to design processes. Oxman's work, while digital, is reliant on a deep and thorough understanding of material qualities. So I believe that materials collections, providing a hands-on tactile experience, will become increasingly vital. There's much to look forward to in the realm of materials-based design, but it is necessarily founded on the reality of touch and the need for designers to develop tactile literacy. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rebecca. We often say in at least um, UK and Ireland that we don't get enough papers from people that are actually architectural librarians, so it's really great to have you here. Being you, uh, at least UK and Ireland, we actually have our next, next speaker from Dublin, so uh, we, we can actually be through to our name. Um, and uh, John Paul Dowling, he's um, uh, being heavily involved with uh, typography and is currently um, uh, education director and board member and fellow of the International Society of uh, Typography Designers and um, in uh, 2017 he was awarded fellowship of the Royal Society of Arts. Um, he is, um, um, oh, what is it, sorry. Um, do, do, do. And he um, has lectured internationally um, on, uh, on the subject and has um, uh, done many presentations at conferences on the subject and is currently working at the National College of Art and Design in Dublin. Yeah, um, his paper has um, a really playful title. And how, how do you actually want to um, pronounce this title? Because it could be Archivist or Archivist or, well, you will tell us. 
Hello. Um, okay, so maybe I'll start by explaining the title because that's the most question I get a lot. Uh, so this uh, presentation is about a project that um, I've ran for the last three years in Dublin, but prior to that I ran the same project when I used to teach at the University of the West of England in Bristol. Uh, the title is kind of awkward, it's Archive or Archivist. Um, the intention of how it's put together is that you have an archive which is uh, generally a physical uh, body of work and then you have an archivist inside the parentheses that works within that kind of physical space to help people access knowledge. Um, so the, the whole project is about, the, the crux of it is active learning in design education. Um, and as I've said, I'm at the National College of Art and Design in Dublin, and this project we worked with NIVEL. So anyone who was at the Arles conference last year would be familiar with NIVEL, as it was held in uh, NCAD. Uh, and the context of the project that we ran with NIVEL, there's a lot of different kind of points of how I decided to, to run this project, I suppose. One would be that I believe that all design education should be taught through active learning uh, and particularly graphic design and all the graphic design I teach from my time in the UK and in Ireland is taught in, um, in reality. So every project is a live project. Uh, students aren't allowed work in the make-believe. They can't pretend that they worked for Nike or worked for some big brand. None of those projects are, uh, are allowed and we, don't, we certainly don't give briefs that encourage that type of work. So we give briefs that give perimeters and context to the world around them and the students have to go out and engage with society and culture and people and interview and all knowledge that they, that they translate through the design aesthetic has to come from a point of reality. Um, then also the, the idea to work with archives was, um, I suppose from my own experience, I'm, I started art school 20 years ago this year and you know the internet was in its infancy and I got my first email in that year but it was a time when you still had to invest in knowledge where you had to buy books and you had to follow you know the designers or the design studios that you were interested in you had to you know pay for that knowledge and you kind of protected it and you'd kind of show it off like as if it was a record that you bought if you were a DJ um, and then looking at kind of from that point to where students are now and the internet and these students being um, digital natives, you know, I noticed that students weren't using books much anymore. Anytime we were discussing kind of topics with students, they would pull out their laptop, they would show me Pinterest or Google Image or Wikipedia, uh, and all the points of knowledge came through a digital kind of platform and format, and which is fine to some extent, but also they were uh, disregarding the library uh, or the archive. So for me, it, it's really important that both as educators and, and as designers and individuals that we support our libraries and we have a kind of moral and ethical responsibility, I believe, to do that. Um, and particularly educators in, in the art design fields that we really, you know, the educators should be actively using the libraries within their teaching and embedding them and not just having reading lists at the end of briefs or reading lists at the end of kind of module documentation that either the students don't read or they don't even go and take their books out so that we have to play an active role in pushing the students towards the, the libraries or these repositories of knowledge. Um, and there was a few other kind of points within that that kind of gave it context, uh, but also to to teach um, design, and particularly this project was about typography, uh, and the brief itself was simply to, to use the Nival Archive and to put on an exhibition in the form of the book. But within all of that, it allowed us to teach typography in its kind of full extent from the letter form all the way through to the word, the sentence, the paragraph, the chapter, the book, to teach hierarchy of type, to teach long form and short form text, to teach things around licensing of typefaces and images, to using other people's content um, and a variety of, of other um, areas. Uh, so as I said, the brief was pretty straightforward. You have to find something within the archive that kind of resonated with you, and you had to then translate that into an exhibition. So there was an element of curation that uh, resulted in a, in a book. Um, just to give you a kind of a bit more context on the brief that the students got. So they were told, you know, as a designer, that gathering and organizing and designing content is key to your practice. So students were asked to explore the role of the curator within the context of professional graphic design. The brief asked students to engage with a social, cultural environment outside of the studio and investigate a subject using primary research methods. Uh, students were expected to study their subject thoroughly and with a critical awareness that demonstrated understanding of the subject, audience and cultural capital. Uh, and the exhibition would manifest itself in the form of a publication that explores their chosen elements or aspects of this archive. 
uh, and this could be an aspect of heritage, history, cultural impact within Ireland, the role of the artist, gallery tradition, uh, the national and international standing of NIVAL, and I should have qualified, actually NIVAL is the National Irish Visual Arts Library and it holds the widest collection and documentation of both art and design uh, within the state. Um, their curation, uh, where they use exploration, analysis, selecting, interpreting and editing of the archives should dictate um, their content. Uh, and collaboration was a massive part of this project. So one, the students were put into groups of two or three students and they formed their own little design studio. So they had to learn to collaborate with each other. But they also then had to collaborate with NIVAL as an archive and the archivists working within NIVAL to gain access to the, the, the knowledge within NIVAL and um, the documentation and the works. Uh, and also they had to, as part of the project, they had to interview and speak to either the artists that they had chosen if they were still living or the artist estate or whoever held rights to the work um, before they could progress the project. So again, when I go back to saying that we do all projects in reality, they're done in the real world. So they had to gain permission to reproduce the images and the works um, of the artist. So they, they understand the professional context of working as a designer in a world where prior to this, that they're pulling images from Google Image and are using them without copyright. Um, so again, it allows us to look at kind of copyright and the reality of publishing material that's not generated by yourself. Um, so yeah, the collaborative aspect was really key to the project and it kind of forced them to think about what it is to be a, a professional graphic designer. Um, and it also meant that the students had to um, work together, but also had to document how they work together as a group of students. So you couldn't have just one person in the group kind of leading and doing everything. Everyone had to uh, contribute. And we kind of forced that on them because we made it an accessible part of the project. Um, so yeah, like I said, so the interviews became a very impor important part of the project where students went out and engaged with uh, the wider community or the artists or the, the people who owned it, the estates of the artists. Uh, and this is a real important thing to how we teach design in Dublin uh, and how dialogue is this really important thing within, uh, within design and actually getting out and talking to people. I describe a lot, uh, are often the type of design that we teach in NCAD in Dublin is a designer as journalist. So you have to go out and find, like a journalist has to go out and find a story. You can't give him a brief and tell him go to your room and make it up and come back. Uh, and for too long, design has kind of been taught like that. Um, graphic design, certainly, where students are given a problem and they're told, go and solve it, and they just go to their room and they figure out some stuff and do some aesthetics and come back and say, here, we've solved it. So the way we teach design is that you have to go out and find a problem. You have to identify a problem first, and then you solve it second, and it exists within the real world. So you have to go and find that, and you have to document it and prove that, it, um, that this is a problem that needs solving. So like that, when they had access to the archive, they had to go find something within the archive that interests them, and then that's just your starting point, and then you frame that by going outside and talking to people. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the books just to give you a little bit of context of the type of work and some of the stories behind the books that were produced um, uh, through this, this project with Nivel. So we started the project in Dublin in 2016. Uh, the first book that I'm going to show, and I've got some images books, some have more kind of interesting stories than others, but a good place to start was this book was about the Distillers Press, which is uh, the letterpress studio that's in NCAD in Dublin. And it's got uh, the widest collection of um, uh, let letterpress, um, I suppose machinery and materials and fonts, over 500 cases of type um, within Ireland. And most of the books that I'm going to show today were made in the distiller's press. So whether the, the, the binding of the books was on there or even just down to the guillotining or the box cutting of the books or to different techniques where it's letterpress printing or embossing. Uh, but these particular students looked at the distiller's press and what was held within the Nival archive. Um, they went out and they interviewed all the different people who were the head technicians within the distiller's press and they created quite a comprehensive documentation of the press from its inception to, to, to modern day. Um, and it's really important as well that the students, every decision that's made is backed up um, with reasoning. So that goes from the type of binding to the size of paper to the typefaces chosen are all got um, conceptual relevance to the content that they, they're describing within, within the publications. Another work from 2016 was about uh, an artist called Patrick Jolly, 
Um, and Patrick Jolly, uh, these images aren't great actually, they're quite small, but he was a, a, a film artist or video artist uh, of the time who used to destroy most of his work and then document it through video. So it was kind of performance that was documented through video. So these particular students produced a book on Jolly's work uh, and then went on through, there's a series of different um, editions of the book where it goes through different stages of burning. So they actually destroyed the book at the, uh, as they went through the, uh, at the end of the project and then they documented that in a separate book. So they created a book that they destroyed a book and then there was no book. So then they had to do another book to document the book that they destroyed. And then they did a video piece as well, uh, which slightly kind of broke the brief, but we, we were quite happy with. And this is an image of the secondary book, which was done with um, binding together envelopes because Jolly used to write a lot about his works because he destroyed them all uh, and he used to post it to his sister. Um, so I'll just flick through some of these a little bit kind of faster. That's the book again made with the envelopes. Uh, and it was a really lovely story to this book in that, so Patrick Jolly um, died and there's, there's talk that his final piece of work was his own death. There was no proof that he kind of committed suicide, but they think he possibly did commit suicide and it was his final piece of work um, that he destroyed himself as an artist. So there was a lot of kind of, not baggage, I suppose, but there was a, it was an emotionally charged project because the students were dealing then with the, um, the estate of Patrick Jolly, which is um, run by his sister. So they were going back and forth and kind of okaying everything with her to make sure that, um, I suppose, that they paid respect to him as an artist and didn't um, make decisions, I suppose, that would make the family feel uncomfortable. Uh, but they were very happy, actually, with the work in the end. And I'm going to show a little video at the end of this presentation, which will show the launch of this. Um, but again, it instills as well, when they had to work with an archive of an artist that was no longer with us, the, the, the responsibility you have as a designer to be not only ethically responsible, but morally responsible, but just to the fact that this is someone's life that you're talking about and documenting. And this isn't pretend, this is the real world. Uh, so then if we go to 2017, um, a project from that year was dealing with Sybil Connolly, who's a very famous Irish so it's fashion designer, um, but also a furniture designer, textile designer. So there would be a wide collection of Sybil Connolly's work held in Ireland in different archive and different um, museums and institutions. Uh, and these students again, uh, so they write all the content as well for the book. So they're not allowed kind of go to Wikipedia and just copy and paste. They have to, so we work with um, the Visual Culture, School of Visual Culture. So we have lecturers come in and talk to the students about how you would write for kind of publication and how that differs from maybe writing an essay. Um, so, and again, that's a rule we have within, across the whole three years of our program, that if you want to design a book, you have to write it. Uh, and we, we, we really do enforce that and they do write those books. Um, so again, this book again is kind of sympathetic to the, to the kind of different kind of narratives of Sybil Connolly in terms of her work and her practice. And it used a lot of these kind of uh, what you call tip-ins in book design to kind of sub-comment on the images that were being shown. Uh, another book uh, was by uh, media artist Les Levine, which ended up being called Cool Dude, which was a placeholder title because the students thought that uh, he was a really cool dude uh, and it ended up being the title of the work. Uh, there's a piece of work about an artist, David um, Godbold. Um, and again, this is a good example of where the students use the work of the artist to um, have direct influence on the design of the book. So um, uh, David uh, Godbold would work with a variety of kind of medias, a lot of kind of layering, a lot of um, kind of transfer kind of paper, translucent paper. So they use the production methods that he would use within his own art in the construction of the book. Um, I think there's a little bit of a thing there that reads about here. It says, yeah, the three layers of unrelated material are brought together and arranged with an unlikely harmony where the meaning of the piece is never fully um, confirmed, but only a suggestion. So they worked with this a lot, kind of throughout this kind of idea of hiding things and revealing things within the work. Uh, and then the kind of three parts to the kind of story of his work, he generally always dealt with three materials. So they bound the book in this kind of concertina way. So it had three sections within the book that opened in different ways, but closed together to become one book. Uh, in 2018, um, again, we had a number of um, books again. This uh, was about, uh, so these students came across within the archive, the, Dublin Event Guide, which was a published uh, magazine, which ran for about 20 years, 
um, which again, this was kind of a revelation to the students that kind of pre-internet that you would have to get this physical publication to know what was happening in terms of culturally within Dublin. And like literally this blew their mind. They were like, oh my God, like imagine, like you ca oh, you'd have no phone or anything. You wouldn't know what was going on. You'd have, like, have to get it. So, uh, so there was 20 years of these publications that would come out um, monthly. But the year 1991, they used as a kind of visual lens to focus the project on. Because this was the year that Dublin was um, a, a city of culture. Um, so they kind of recognized that this, uh, the Dublin Event Guide had this really important place within culture in Ireland in that it gave um, people access or information to what was happening within the city. And this being, you know, the, the year of culture 1991 being such an important year, they used that as the kind of point, as their kind of editorial filter to, to go through the work. But it became a much kind of wider reaching publication as well that they produced in that they started to understand the visual language that was being used in graphic design through this magazine and could look at it across 20 years in Ireland and how that visual language kind of changed. Uh, and also they kind of subverted that visual language for their, their own ends within the work. But yeah, it was a, a really uh, a beautiful project and not only just to, to see the students' reaction, I suppose, or just their own acknowledgement of what kind of happened before them and to fully kind of get that in terms of pre-internet technology, i.e. the book. Um, another project uh, from the same year was titled Dutch Gold. Um, and this is a kind of play on words. One, this project was about, uh, there was an advertising agency in Ireland called Sun Advertising. And back in the, oh, I'm trying to think the dates now, but I think it was the early 80s or late 70s, the, the guy who owned that ad agency recognized that the Dutch were doing the best graphic design in the world. So he went to, to Holland and he headhunted three of the best Dutch graphic designers of the time and he brought them over to Ireland to his, Indus, or to his ad agency and they started designing a lot of, um, they uh, advertised for major kind of clients in Ireland. I suppose the, the biggest would have been Aer Lingus, which is our national airline. But they had a direct impact on the visual language and the visual culture of Ireland and were pushing, you know, kind of Bauhaus, um, kind of design thinking uh, and design representation through their design and changed the face of Irish graphic design, which is the, this Dutch influence. So they looked at those three designers and this kind of story of how the, the influence of Dutch design and Irish design, um, they call it Dutch gold, which I'm not sure if you have in the UK, but it's literally the cheapest lager you can buy in an off license in Ireland. <laughs> so they were, it was a little pun on them as students as well. So when they think of Dutch gold, it's like the cheapest lager you can buy in, a, in an off license but also this notion of how the, the Dutch influenced Irish design. Um, they went and they interviewed uh, the, the members that were still alive um, uh, from the Dutch kind of trio. They interviewed uh, people, because some of these guys actually went on to teach in Ireland while they were in Ireland. So again, they were pushing this, these Bauhaus kind of techniques and uh, kind of international Swiss typographic style within Ireland. So they started to have not only a direct impact on the visual culture of Ireland of the time, but also on the, the students that went on to be practitioners were taught with this kind of Bauhaus aesthetic and, and approach to graphic design. Um, and they interviewed people who were taught by these guys and then they went on to have um, their own design studios and how that had a direct impact and who they are as designers. There's one kind of quote there, which was by Connor Clark. He said, uh, Cork Haslan was one of the, or Cass and was one of the, um, the trio of Dutch designers. He said, I had Core for the first year and this was at, at Dunleary Institute of Art and Design, uh, but his influence continued through my preceding three years and I guess still to this day. So again, it was a lovely little project that acknowledged the, the importance of this one action of a, a, a guy who owned an ad agency and going and getting three Dutch designers to come to Ireland. Um, one of my favorites uh, that the students did, this is a, another project which was titled 88, uh, was the students came across this logo um, which was designed for the millennium um, in Dublin in that uh, Dublin was a thousand years old, although it's kind of been proven that the dates are kind of wrong. They just used it for the, the purpose of uh, having an event. But uh, so they came across this logo um, and they were doing a project about the logo and who designed it. But all they could find was a Wiki Wikipedia entry um, that said it was designed by a guy called Thomas Ryan, Ryan RHA. Um, and Nivel didn't have a whole lot either on it, only some ephemera of the logo and the objects the logo was applied to uh, and that it was designed by Thomas Ryan or HA. So the students went 
They produced a book which is in three sections. So the first section is kind of what was there within Nival, which is the yellow section, the blue section, and the event of the in 1988. And uh, the second section was about the the logo, and the third section was about the designers. So it was three books that became one. And the idea of the narrowing of the information was within the three books. So you start with Nival, this kind of broad kind of scope, and then you start looking at the logo, and you start you know getting more kind of filtered down to what you're talking about, and then looking at the the kind of designers. But they found. Well, there was a, a beautiful aspect to this in that so they could find so little about who designed it or anything else other than this one like Wikipedia entry. So they contacted the guy who was supposed to have designed it, who told him he only dealt in written letters because he didn't have an email address. Uh, so they had to write to him, which was a novel thing for them. And he responded in writing and they had to write back. Um, but he didn't design the logo. And he said it was wrongly attributed to him. Um, so they're can't really figure it out. They're going around talking to other design agencies in Dublin going, do you know who designed this logo? Do you know who designed this logo? And people don't know or design. I think Thomas Ryan designed it. And they're like, no, he, he didn't design it. So it became this kind of detective story of them trying to find out who designed the logo. And then one day, this is the actual logo on a milk bottle. Um, so one day in the studio, the students are still like talking about, they have the logo on screen. And one of the guys who was a student who worked on the Dutch Gold project, who um, had recently, he just kind of joined the course, he didn't start on the course, he'd moved back from LA, his father was Irish, worked for Disney, um, and he always, had all, all, he always had stories about stuff his dad did. His dad like did this, did that for Disney. And he was walking past, he said, oh, my dad designed that logo. <laughs> and they're all like, they all call BS on it. They're like, he's always telling us stuff his dad did, you know, there's no way. So anyway, they went and contacted his dad, and sure enough, he designed the logo, as a student in Dunleary, that was an open call competition. Um, and uh, so yeah, so they found out a new piece of knowledge. So it was attributed to this guy, this is Thomas Rhines. He designed the back of the coin, which was a commemorative coin for the, the millennium in 1988, which seems to be where the confusion got that he got attributed to doing this logo as well. But it was this lovely story where the students went out as kind of designers, journalists, or as detectives, and they were able to fix a piece of um, knowledge within Nival. They went back and they go, well, actually, your information is wrong. And here's the correct information. Uh, so it was a really kind of lovely um, story, I suppose, of how they had a direct impact on, on the archive and, and were able to impart a little bit of change. Uh, James O'Connor was the name of the designer who did the, the logo. Um, so yeah, another a, important part. So there are the books, our summative books. We would have like, we had everything from, I think the first year there was 50 students uh, worked on the project to about kind of 30 or 40 students the, the, the last two years. Uh, so while they have to design a book that's in the, um, an exhibition in the form of a book, they also have to put on an exhibition uh, of the books at the end of the project. And it's a, it's a kind of pop-up exhibition, it's just one day, and what it does is it recognizes uh, the work the students have done. They have to also invite the artist or the artist's estate to the exhibition, so it's added pressure again that they're gonna see the final pieces of work. Uh, and they have to do everything within the exhibition themselves. They have to design the branding of the exhibition, find the space, do all the organizing, invite all the people. Um, this is just quickly some of the kind of branding. This was the first year how it was branded. This is the second year how we branded it. And this is the year just gone. Um, and if this works, I'm going to show you a very short little film about the exhibition night. Yes.
the, at the end, of, or I should just say the, the film that you could see at the end of that exhibition, or at, of that film, the film within the film was uh, Patrick Jolly's work. So they actually destroyed the book. The final act was eating the last page of the book. Um, but that exhibition also marks the induction of the works back into Nival. So then Nival take the works that they've produced back into the archive. So now these students become documented like designers within Ireland that are part of the National Irish Visual Arts Library. And I should have qualified earlier on that this is, the, this is the first project they do when they come into my department. So this isn't designers with a couple of years experience or students, this is the very first project they do. So the, the quality and standard of work I put down to the pressure that's on them because you're working within a real world context and you're working with real people, real clients, whether that you see that client as being the archive or you see it as being the artist, but and you knowing that you're going to exhibit this to the public at the end. So it really forces the students to work really, really hard. Um, I suppose that's the crux of everything that we do within our department and this project is is that as well as a very good example. It's three very simple things that I teach across all areas of design, regardless of the medium we're working in or the, or the output or whatever, is that we research, we design, and we publish, and we make public. And it doesn't matter what type of graphic design you're doing. If you're working, uh, you know, servicing a, a commercial entity, or you're working with a cultural institution, or you're working as an individual, you essentially, you research, you design, and you make public in whatever format's most appropriate. And this project is a, is a very good example of that. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't know if, about you, but I, I had the feeling um, uh, during this conference that there are many trends that gives you a sense of continuity in one way or another, and I think your presentation gives us a sense of continuity with last year's um, wonderful um, conference that we had in Dublin. So thank you very much. Um, so our um, next and last uh, panelist um, is um, Sarah. The way <laughs> and um, Sarah is art and architecture librarian at the University of Oregon, and uh, she has received a master's degree in information science with a concentration in library science in, science in 2014, and has worked in art and, art and architecture libraries since 2012. And uh, following a career in art museums, uh, doing education and exhibit design. Uh, currently, as the Art and Architecture Librarian at the University of Oregon, Sarah is most um, interested in outreach, uh, creating and um, uh, uh, creativity and creation in the library, and revamp revamping instruction to focus on ac active learning and student success. Uh, her paper is titled Altering. Um, Altering Altering Artist Books um, Introduction Using Learning Objectives in, um, uh, to Inspire Active Learning. So, Sarah. Sarah. Hello, um, thank you. And I've been really, it's been really great to hear you guys speak about what's going on in your library. So thank you very much for that. So I'm basically continuing the theme of active learning that I've heard a lot throughout this conference yesterday and today, specifically by talking about the implementation and evaluation of exercises that we've been using in artist books instruction in our library. So we're gonna kind of do an introduction to what's going on, the background, where it came from, talk about learning objectives and how they've influenced um, the activities we're doing. The activities themselves, so there's one that focuses on form and structure and one that focuses on materials. Um, evaluation and that ongoing, we need to assess, we need to assess, we need to build this into our practice um, and ways I've been trying to do that. And then our benefits and challenges with this project and there we go, okay, so. Uh, about two years ago, I'd been in my job for five months, and so I was pretty new to the collection, new to the, the system, and an art professor came to me and asked me to do six introduction to artist book sessions. So these were two hour long sessions, back to back, three one day, three the next day. And I said yes, because I am excited and I wanted to know more about this collection anyway, I didn't have a lot of experience working with it. Um, and. 
immediately didn't know what to do. So I modeled it on artist book sessions I had been in before, which was a lecture-based thing. So I did all this research, and I learned about this book and this artist, and I read artist book theory, and I did all this stuff, and I created this very dry <laughs> lecture um, that was like an hour and 15 minutes long. Um, then there would be 30 minutes for the students to explore the books afterwards, and that would give me 15 minutes to like get a glass of water and reset the room. Um, and it was really, really painful. Um, the, the first session was fine, my energy was high, it was easy to talk. Um, the second session, I could see their eyes kind of spacing out, and um, I was so tired already and I still had four more to do. And so when I got done with them, I said, I'm never doing this again. This was terrible. <laughs> I don't ever want to have to talk that long in one like set of days ever. Um, and so I did more research, but instead of researching artist books, I started trying to research how people are using artist books in their instruction. And I know people are doing things, active learning with artist books. I need you all to publish because there seems to be a, I know people are doing great things. It's very hard to find. Um, access to those things. And so if you're doing that, please, please, please write a paper about it. Um, I did find a couple articles, and one of them talked about making as part of the process, so teaching students how to bind books. Um, and I've done that as a workshop type thing, which has been really fun, but for this particular class, they're art students, so they already have a session set aside for making books. So they really didn't need that from me. So I needed to think of something else active for them to do. And so I decided to just start over. Throw everything I had researched away and just think about, okay, whenever I do any sort of inf information literacy instruction in a more traditional sense, I start with the question, what do they need to know? And so the conclusion I came to is that, well, context, a little bit of context for um, artist books history can be helpful, it's really not what they needed. And so having all of that historic information was just filling up their space with stuff that they didn't need because the, the point, their point was they were trying to make artist books and they were trying to um, understand what artist books were. They weren't writing a paper on who made the first artist book or whatever. So I didn't need to, I didn't need to go that deep into the history. Um, and really what I wanted them to understand was the, the like, large number of tools they had available to them when creating their own artist books. Like their, the possibilities are virtually endless, the, the things that they can do to kind of communicate what they want to communicate. So this project really came about because I don't like lecturing. Um, but then secondarily because the students didn't need what I was lecturing to them about. Um, okay. So I'm not gonna really get into a discussion about what artist books are, because that's really complex, and I think it's an interesting conversation. Um, I don't think it's really helpful, especially for introductory students, to have that conversation. So I decided just to start with the, when I inherited this collection, this was the definition it came with, so a work of art in book form. Which, to me, as a librarian, well, that's great. I have totally wide, flexible collection possibilities with this definition. It's kind of fun to think about um, and talk about. It's really, really not helpful to students. Um, and so what I wanted to do is to kind of come up with a better framework that talked more about what they needed. So the idea was that um, really it is a work of art in book form and so that means that it communicates something. So it, there could be a story, there could be a point they're trying to get across. We're not making value judgments on whether or not those stories are meaningful or worthwhile or good or bad, but there is some sort of information that's trying to be portrayed. Um, usually they're intended for individual interaction. Um, since then I've become aware of an artist named Colette Fu who makes room size pop-up books that you're supposed to hang out with other people in. Um, but I think that's an exception to the norm, so I kind of still keep this in here because you know, these students have two weeks to make an artist book. They're not gonna make a room sized installation piece. Um, the story that's being told is mediated by our interaction with it, and that relates to the form, like um, 
how we open it, how we get the information, as well as the materiality of it. How does it feel in our hand? What sorts of um, what sorts of meanings do we put on the materials that are used? And that the artist is control, in control of these things. So that's one of the ways that we're differentiating these from these kind of standard books that we might have in the library. And so really the students needed to understand the variety of elements in, that book artists can use to tell the stories. And I'm focusing mostly on form and material. And really what we're talking about here then are different types of literacies, right? So haptic or tactile um, literacy, visual literacy, um, and cultural literacy. Around that same time, I was reading this article called Don't Use a Hammer When You Need a Screwdriver. And it's talking about how to create better learning objectives and specifically how to create learning objectives that allow you to assess what you're doing and provide those numbers that library administrators are asking for more and more and more, like how can, what are your numbers to show that this is um, valuable. So in this system, you define the audience. So in my case, it's gonna be the students in my class. Um, you define observable behaviors and the Ob observable part is really, really important. So verbs like contemplate and understand are really great verbs, and they are things that we want them to do, but it's not something, I can't observe someone contemplating something. They could be staring intently at a book and thinking about like, oh, I'm meeting my, my friend for ice cream in an hour. So changing my learning objectives so that they have something that I can see the students doing in them and then the conditions under which they, they have to do this. So in my case, it would be that they do this within the constraints of the class, looking at this specific book or um, doing this um, activity. And I didn't use degree statements. So basically I, I decided, well, I'm redoing all of this at once. I'm just gonna apply what I'm learning in this learning objectives to creating these exercises. So the first art, um, exercise has to do with material. And so I've defined, or I've decided that material is one of the primary ways that a book artist can differentiate their book from a, a more standard book. Um, they don't have to, but they can. Um, it's also one of the more obvious ways. So the material is much more, a very easy concept for the students to grasp onto, and so I start with it. Um, because they can see that this does not look like this, it does not feel like this standard book. Um, it's also really important for art students, right? So they, um, they're going to be taking other classes, probably not very many other ones where they have to make an artist's book, but they're going to be putting their work out in the world and they're going to be using materials and they need to be thoughtful and understanding of what those materials mean to different people and how they impact the, the sort of point they're trying to get across. And I think that's a really important part of teaching literacy is that, um, is, kind of thinking about, is this something that they can use outside of this context? So for this activity, I pass around a bag of materials. Each student reaches in and grabs out a material, and it's a variety of things, different types of fabric. Um, you can kind of see some of the examples, uh, rope, different kinds of wood, leather, moss, um, different things that they just kind of spend some time holding and feeling and thinking about. So they're, they're supposed to answer three questions that are meant to get them to think about the physical properties of the material, the historical use of it, and then also their own personal or social um, relationship with it or cultural um, significance to it. Um, once they've spent about three to five minutes doing that, kind of varies on the class. Some students are so into it and they're writing really slow and they're really like, oh yeah, this piece of wood and it feels like this and it, like everyone, so you see someone kind of covertly try to smell their, <laughs> smell their material, like what's that about? Um, and so then I ask the students, I usually have three kinds of wood in here. Um, so a plywood or like a compressed um, building material, a, piece of a log, so a more raw state wood, and a piece of two by four, so another building material. And I ask those students that have those to describe their objects, and then I ask the class as a whole to brainstorm what sort of stories go along with those particular types of materials. So, you know, a story about nature and woods and camping and fire is, is a different kind of wood than stories about building and architecture and things like that. We do the same thing for leather, because leather is a really 
rich material as well. And then the students see a selection of books that use materials in different ways to emphasize the story that's being told. I think a really good um, example, the um, picture in the middle, that book where the person's hand is on it with the ring on, that's rabbit fur. So it feels so nice. It's really, really soft and feels good. And we also have a book that I don't have pictured here, but it's made out of sandpaper. So that's not something you really like to have in your hand. But it's interesting, right? Because so so we have this thing we want in our hand and this thing that we don't want in our hand, but nothing was killed in the creation of sandpaper, right? And so almost invariably, and especially I think because we're not a culture that eats a lot of rabbit, um, like some student will be holding it and they'll be like, oh, it's so soft. And then also they'll be like, it was a bunny. <laughs> and so um, these kind of, and I think that's really important when they think about the story that they're gonna tell. Um, and so I'm able to see that they're meeting the learning outcomes because they are, I'm hearing them discuss the ways the materials impact. Um, I'm also able to read what they're writing on the pieces of paper. Okay, activity two, form and structure. I'm conflating these two ideas and I think in a more advanced class there may be benefit in kind of separating form from structure, but for these students it seems to work pretty well to kind of combine these ideas of scale um, and also how you interact with the book into a one chunk. <laughs> In this case, I show the examples first because I found that um, it works fine to have them explore materials and then look at examples, but then if I have them explore form, they only answer the questions about materials. And so showing them what I mean by form has proven to be a little bit more successful. So I put them in groups of four, and each group gets one book, one sentence about what the book is about, and they're asked questions about how the form and structure of the book um, either detracts from or adds to the story that's being told. And it's really great watching them explore these books. Um, they challenge each other, they say, I think this, well, I think this, and they get really excited. And for a lot of them, this is the first time they've really handled an artist's book on their own. So I think that's part of, part of it's getting them over the fear of touching these objects that they think of as art pieces that you generally aren't supposed to touch. Um, and, but they're really learning from each other. Um, then each group presents about their book and how it relates to form and structure. And I found this to be really beneficial to my own, like everyone's while I'll throw in a book that I really don't like. And then by the end I'm like, oh yeah, I didn't think of that. And so it's really, I think also this collaborative way of thinking that can um, kind of open up how we um, interpret these books. And so again, the learning objective is observable. Um, because I'm able to hear them critique, I'm able to hear their conversations and kind of understand that they are getting this idea that the form is an important part of the book. Um, okay, the elusive assessment um, part of things. So um, I've been experimenting with different ways to do this. Some I think are more beneficial than others. So um, talking with the professors, I've overwhelmingly um, gotten positive responses from them. The professor specifically said that he noticed an increased thoughtfulness in um, the materials the students were using, and one of the TAs said, wow, they're making so many fewer accordion books. <laughs> and so I think because accordion is kind of an easier format to use, a lot of students had been doing that in the past, so we've kind of, some are still doing that, and I, because I think it's a meaningful format to use sometimes, um, but fewer of them are, so I think that was good. Um, I've been doing a post-class survey, and um, it's not, I'm not getting the best response, it's, I'm getting about 12, it's 120 students total, so, and I'm getting 12 responses each term, so 10%. Um, but it is showing, at least from the respondents, that most of them, or all of them, are moving from no or a superficial understanding of artist books to a deeper one where they feel that they could, they could communicate what artist books are to a friend, so I think that's good. They also indicate um, that they understand how the format and the material impact the stories and that they got good ideas for their projects. So to me, they're saying that these things are happening and that's what I wanted to have happen, so that's good. Um, Surveys are also good for recall. I send it out a week afterwards and that makes them, they're halfway into their um, process then and then they're like, oh yeah, wait, we were talking about material and I was thinking about this, but maybe I should think about this instead. Um, this spring term, for the first time, I went to the critiques 
And it, I had read an article that said if you have access to the final projects, you are able to do different types of assessment. I'm gonna say that I don't know for sure that that is true <laughs> because my experience was that I went to four of the six classes for their critiques and um, two of them uh, were by one uh, teaching assistant and another two were by a different teaching assistant. And so teaching assistant one, overwhelmingly, the students were thoughtful about their form, they were thoughtful about their materials, they made really, really creative and um, thoughtful work. And with teaching assistant number two, there were a couple of examples in the class that I felt like were really strong, but overall, I don't think that they had grasped what, was, what I was trying to communicate as much. And so, I don't know what to do with that information. So I have this like, wow, I did great. Oh, I didn't do very good <laughs> situation going on. And I think um, maybe this means that I need to explore ways to ask them during that critique process what the role the library played. A couple of the successful ones did say the library session was really important to me. It taught me that an artist's book isn't always a book. Um, but you can see some of the examples that I thought were kind of stronger examples like this a uh, girl who made the interior of a house um, and was talking about our relationship with space as her story, and it was just super creative. Um, someone made a bath bomb with a book inside. This was one where it was a very creative use of material, but I cannot figure out what the bath bomb has to do with the story he was telling, <laughs> but it was an interesting use of material. So kind of successes and interesting things. So. Um, it was fun though, and I'll definitely do it again. I'm just not entirely sure how it works in terms of assessment, um, but I'll, I'll keep working with the TAs on that. And then finally, I did peer observation for this. So I had a fellow librarian um, who's really, really into instruction, actually the author of that article, one of the authors of that article, come into my class and um, observe. And basically, every two minutes, she wrote down what I was doing and what the students were doing. And so this was really, it wasn't really great for addressing what I was teaching, but it was really great at addressing how I was teaching. So um, we could kind of see when the students were active versus when they were passive, when I was lecturing versus when I was receiving information from them. And, um, you know, she was making notes of my behavior. So one thing I learned is that I like to ask questions that I'm not expecting an answer to, and I don't actually think that's a good thing to do. Um, so that's something that I'm working on now and trying to improve this process, not only by what I'm teaching, but also by how I'm delivering it. Um, challenges. Okay, so I'm kind of changing the challenges into next steps. So number one, asking better questions. I'm also kind of trying to turn it around so that like I, I pull out a book and I say, okay, what's this book about? And I have them tell me what it's about. Um, whereas, especially two years ago, it was more like, this book is about this, but now I want them to kind of tell me um, what it is. I also kind of want to um, figure out some sort of immediate assessment, and I was thinking like, maybe having them text a picture somewhere, but I don't like that, like I think it's a class issue to assume that all students have a phone that can do that. Um, and so I'm thinking of like maybe a whiteboard and a, I don't know, somehow to get impressions from them right at the end of the session. Um, and particularly because I think there may be books that I'm pulling that are really, really useful to them and books that I'm pulling that aren't as useful to them. Um, I want to increase the survey participation. I'm thinking of incentivizing it in some way. Thank you. Um, the other thing that I'm struggling with is expanding this to other classes. So this class, I have this professor who is just like, do what you want. Yeah, that sounds great, I love it. Um, other professors that I work with this collection with um, have, I th mm, how do I say this? Very specific ways that they think that art history or, or things related to art history should be taught. And, and that's not active. <laughs> that's usually like, look at this thing. It was made in this year. Remember that year. Then, you know, remember this theme about that thing and who did it and where they lived or whatever, which I think can be useful when you're looking at some things, but I don't think it's necessarily useful in this context. 
and I haven't gotten really brave about being pushy about like, hey, we can do this thing and you, we can do that. We can do your thing too, but let's try to at least have, I read an article that said as long as there were 30 minutes of active learning in a session, even if the session was two hours long, that was gonna improve student retention and um, feelings of the class. Uh, so I want to start spreading it out. And then the, the making component, it works really well in the workshop setting. I'm interested in if there are classes where it might work as well. And the benefits, though, I think are an important part. So <laughs> way less exhausting. I can, like, the first day with the three classes, I'm fine at the end. And after the sixth class, I'm tired, but I'm like, you know what, I just need to get a beer and I'm gonna be fine. I don't need to, I'm not like, I don't need to go home and like curl up in a ball and cover myself. So um, that has been really, really positive. I also think it's just generally uh, more rewarding for the students, they're more engaged. Um, I find that like one of the ways that we try to encourage active learning is asking them more questions, but if they're not already engaged, I think that often falls kind of short because you have that one talker in the class and they'll answer every question. But if I get them to go through the exercises, then we have this rapport and they're willing to answer questions. And so they're just more, they're more there with me, which is great. Um, everyone learns more. So their, their projects are improving according to their professors. Um, I thought they were pretty neat <laughs> too. And, and I'm learning, I'm learning more about these books and learning more about what these art students need. You know, because I was an art student like 20 years ago, so it was a, it was a while ago. Um, I'm having ongoing conversations with the professors and the TAs, which is kind of strengthening my relationship with the departments that I'm supporting. And I think um, one thing not to overlook is how much better this is for the collection. So when, we, when we're doing this lecture format, we're bringing the most famous books out by the most famous person, and we're using those same books every single time, which is bad for the books. Um, now, since I'm thinking more conceptually about what they need to know, I can pull different books and every time, to, which is kind of less wear and tear on the collection. It's also more interesting for the TAs who have to see the session multiple times um, that they're able to see new works because I'm pulling from different places in the collection. Um, I do really want to know what you guys want to do, so I, or are doing already. So if you if you're doing active learning with artist books. Um, please email me. I've, I've read a lot about active learning in archives. I think there are some parallels, but I think there is something quite different about art objects versus historical objects that makes it hard to pull that literature into um, what we're doing with artist books. So if you have ideas, please let me know. If you have questions, feel free to email me. I'm Cassie, Thank I work you. at Chelsea College of Arts. Um, it's wonderful to hear about all the things that you guys are doing. Um, is, is it Sarah? Um, I wondered if in, um, there was, I, I don't know if the work that the students are producing is of this quality, but if there was any idea of um, kind of making things full circle and, and by introducing their work into the collection afterwards, perhaps to incentivize them to create higher quality things. As you said, it was a bit mixed in the results. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I do have a different, the letterpress professor and I, she weeds out books and with the permission of the students offers them to the collection. I have mixed feelings about that. I think that artists should be paid for their work and I'm not able to pay students randomly for books that they've made. Um, and so I haven't approached that with this particular um, process yet. It's something that the professor and I started talking about, but I don't know. Um, I'm trying to work within my acquisitions team to see if there is a way for me to offer, even if it's just like $50 or some like amount of money to kind of compensate them for the fact that I, I, think, it's, I think it's better practice that we start teaching them that art is valuable and should be paid for. <laughs> Um, so I'm Jane from the University of Puget Sound, and I just have some observations and questions. So Rebecca, I'd like to thank you. You've inspired me to think about new ways that I can use my makerspace, particularly um, with students that are not in art disciplines, just in terms of introducing them. And also uh, inspired me to think about doing a tactile project on our history of the book with using all the different types of papers that we have in our collections. I think that would be really nice. Uh, John, I can't believe your project. That to me is a model 
I'm, I'm curious to the time component, because it just seems like a huge project to accomplish in a short period of time, so fabulous. And Sarah, great work. I would definitely recommend um, forcing that library to buy some of the books for the students, because when they see projects that other students have done, I think it really resonates and ex it excites them. And I think the concepts that John brought up about just kind of having the pressure on ha having the public see the book. So maybe something you could also do is um, suggest that the crit be held in the art library yeah. and that you can invite other clients. So yeah. that might just be something um, that would resonate with the students. But thank yeah. you all. So that time on that project. Uh, uh, six weeks. And they also, wow. they would only have one day contact with academic staff each week. Uh, they have a full day contact and they're also working on two other projects at the same time. Thank you. Any other questions? Questions? Uh, hi, I'm Richendra. I work for University of the Arts London. Um, Rebecca, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that you'd be happy to talk briefly about how you encourage use of the library because you're saying it's, it's mm -hmm. underused. It's underused, yeah. So, I, I'm exploring new ideas. Um, <laughs> so aside from just talking to faculty and trying to get their interest up, one barrier is, um, some of you may deal with this, uh, I'm in a different building from where the studios are and it's all of a two minute walk. So it's, it's far, far away to come to the <laughs> library. Um, so I do all I can to be there as much as I can and I take things with me when I go, little samples of books or materials, whatever, to generate interest. Um, and one thing I'm gonna try this year, because it is interdisciplinary and we do have thousands and thousands of engineers who are busy making materials, is I want to increase the, the discussion across campus of, between the architects and the engineers, of, of that they're all working on things, they're creating things, architects often using traditional materials like concrete or something, but in a new way. Um, the engineers are making new kinds of concrete or something. So to increase that interdisciplinary discussion, I'm gonna start a brown bag um, where I'm gonna ask grad student particularly engineers, but from any department, to come and talk about their work, to what the lab is busy doing. So it, I, I want to situate it in the materials collection, so that's our backdrop, but they just talk about their materials research and, and, and just the world of materials. And, and to get a dialogue going between the architects, the artists, the engineers, because th there is a lot going on in any small or big university that, that I, I find um, I did an event a couple years ago, and, and what was fun was I had an engineering faculty member come talk and an architecture faculty talk, and they turned out not to know each other, but to really be working on almost the same thing. And so they just loved the fact that they met each other, and, and it's a big, big world. So I want to do more of that kind of interdisciplinary interaction and, and provide a space for that, because the library is a neutral zone. We're not some department or another department. So that's one thought. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other questions? We got a little bit of time, so we can have more questions if people have. No? Okay. Um, is there anything that the panelists might want to add to their presentations or in light of the questions being asked or anything that's been going on? Uh, I, well, one thing I'd add, I can't remember if I said it or not, but it's kind of in response to the same <laughs> question that when I was writing this project, it, was also written, one of the contexts where it came from was the acknowledgement that libraries and archives need numbers and they need to be able to document often what's called widening participation, how they bring people into the libraries and the archives. And from my experience, um, when we ran this project in Bristol, we used to use a different archive every year. And we worked with the Feminist Archive South, we worked with the Arnold Feeney uh, Archive, Spike Island, and every year they would come back to us after the project and ask for kind of any documentation. We had student numbers. And so I realized kind of very quickly that they were using um, this project as part of kind of funding bids, whether it was to the Arts Council or someplace else to say, look, we're doing this work and we're engaging with the, you know, with communities outside of kind of people that just come in our door. So we're being kind of proactive. And all of them came back and said how valuable the project was um, 
for them because of that. And it's worked out the same with NIBAL. The project became part of a funding application from the Arts Council in Ireland that they got, and they ended up getting 140,000 in funding, um, which is not solely down to us, but it played a small part in them being able to document and present these kind of activities. Thank you. Um, anything else? Okay. Well, I, um, um, Sarah, you, uh, Sarah, you said that, um, uh, that you would like to see more uh, in print um, about um, teaching information literacy with artist books. And um, last night um, at the reception, we awarded a life membership to Clive Philpott for his 50 years uh, writing, promoting, organizing. Um, archives and, and exhibitions around um, artist books. So um, I think um, it's a nice call to continue this tradition of writing about it and also the new developments um, on how we use artist books uh, for information literacy. And um, I think the some of his writing and other writings about that appeared in the um, uh, Art Library Journal, but maybe there is a possibility of doing another special issue on this, um, given that there are several presentation um, at this conference about artist books, so hey, maybe the editors might want to take this into uh, um, into their future project uh, list, and um, and I think um, well, it was interesting because all all three presentations were about um, active teaching and learning um, uh, for uh, um, architecture and art students who are primarily haptic learners, so they learn by doing. So there is another way in which they learn, in which they uh, understand the word. So, um, and I think in the, in the past few years, uh, there has been an awful lot done uh, to address um, a less traditional way of teaching them information literacy, because otherwise, like you said, like, like you know, after two minutes, they start wandering around. So, um, yeah. So if nobody has anything else that they want to ask or to add, I think we might finish slightly ahead of schedule, like three minutes ahead of schedule. So um, I just wanted to remind everybody that lunch is gonna be served shortly. Um, there is the exhibitor hall uh, just in front of us and please go and visit them. And I just, um, uh, John Paul, when I was, um, uh, yesterday I was actually visit visiting one of the exhibitors, the um, Heart Research, um, uh, Heart History Research uh, Net. Um, and um, they have a pile of books that they have digitized and with incredible typesets. And I was actually thinking about your presentation. So, and they also, I've been told, they have nice freebies to give, give away. So go visit them. <laughs> so thank you very much to our panelists and to all of you.